welcome to the Ben Wood Johnson podcast. You can visit Dr. Johnson's blog at benwoodpost.com. Dr. Johnson's works can be found at drbenwoodjohnson.com. You can also support Dr. Johnson on Patreon, the link to which is in the description. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Ben Wood Johnson podcast. Uh, today is July 20th, 2020. In other words, it's 7 2020. This is podcast number 54. So I am very excited to have you back with us one more time to talk about philosophy. Whoever you are in the world, a warm welcome to you. This is the place of intersection. This is a place of intellectual crossroad where we talk about things that we think needs to be talked about. Things that society somehow or the intellectual elite somehow uh, are not talking about. This is where we talk about these things here. Now, a disclaimer before we get into this podcast today. We are going to talk about police brutality. Uh, the disclaimer is that this podcast is not intended to be anti-police. It is not intended to be anti-society. It is not a call to action. I'm just making a, a philosophical assessment of society, in this case, the American society. But the podcast itself is not about the police. I was a police officer, so the police community is a community that I respect and adore. Of course, I've had my uh, my my fair share of, of police brutality in America, my fair share of police, uh, you know, uh, disrespect. So, so that doesn't necessarily mean that I put every police officer in the same basket with the police officer that I have had to encounter in my life in America. But what to say it again, this podcast is not about the police. In any case, today we are going to talk about the concept of police brutality, the, uh, the notion that police officers are supposed to serve and protect. When, when we look at the notion of policing in a broader social context, it is evident that the police do not have the job. The, the, the police as an institution does not have the job of serving and protecting rather they have the job of maintaining the status quo again this is only within the context of the larger societal societal context so i am not talking about the police as entity within a particular community that do things a certain way uh you know in relation to the to the citizenry so this conversation is going to be a bit controversial like i said because you may not agree with what i'm about to say in this podcast so i wanted to give you this heads up so you understand where i am coming from this is a philosophical podcast where we talk about society and we talk about society without filter so in this case i am not talking ill of the police i am not talking ill of the institution itself i am looking at the role of the police from a philosophical standpoint the job of the police from a philosophical angle so without further ado let us get right into it uh Recently, something happened in America. Something, depending on where you stand on the social spectrum, terrible happened in America. And the reason I say, depending on where you stand, it is because there is a little bit of subjectivity as to what happened why it happened and what could be done so that incidents like that don't occur. Now, I am a philosopher of common sense. It is an arbitrary, of course, way of looking at myself as a thinker. I'm the kind of person who looks at certain things, certain uh, situations in the world and try to understand it from a pragmatic lens. I am not the kind of thinker who sort of follow the, the stream of, of thoughts. I'm not the kind of thinker who sort of look at the world from, from a particular prism. At least 
I'm not the kind of thinker who sort of looks at the world from from an angle that sort of suits a particular narrative. I consider myself a social observer. And what that means is that I look at society, look at people, entities, institutions within society and try to understand or try to make sense of why they do what they do. When they do what they do or why they don't do what they're supposed to do and when they don't do what they were supposed to do. And based on that observation, I try to come up with explanations that are philosophical in nature to explain what's happening, what is going on. Now, if you have listened to my previous podcasts, you should sort of have a sense of where I stand on the issue of racism. Actually, I have I have an entire podcast dedicated to this concept where I have talked about why it is important to acknowledge racism. And the reason I make that case, or the reason I made that case, it is not necessarily because I think racism is something that could be eradicated. Rather, it is a way to say that racism is here to stay. It is part of who we are. But we need to be able to live with it. We need to be to be able to sort of recognize racism for what it is and, and address it. Of course, it is not going to go away. It's, it's like a, a necessary evil that is always going to be a part of who we are. What I have noticed is that in recent days or weeks, that there's a trend in society, at least in America. All of a sudden, people are conscious about racism. All of a sudden, people are concerned about racism. It is all because these police officers did something out in the open, something that many people have done or continue to do, will continue to do to others every day of their lives. Okay? You see, when the Minneapolis police officer knelt on Mr. George Floyd, when he did that, I think his intent was to undermine this black man to the extent that he could for trying, from his perspective, to resist or defy the institution that he, as a police officer, represents. It happens every day. It happens almost in every aspect of American society. In fact, the whole concept of the police and society was designed to do just that. The idea that their children is an outcast, is an, is, is an outlier, it's a fallacy. I've always said that you cannot have a good police officer. It's, it's a fallacy. You see, the job of the police cannot be a job of good guy versus bad guys. Now, you can be a good person now, as, a, as a person, but when you wear that uniform, when you carry that badge, acting as a police officer, good is not part of the job description. Okay? So, in that sense, the, the idea of, of policing could be something good. It's, it's, it's a fallacy. Of course, those are feel-good ideas that we have sort of come up with to justify the reality we live in. But there is a reality. You cannot deny it. You know, coming up with feel-good understandings about why we are living, we're going through that reality doesn't change the reality in and of itself. But you see, Chauvin was not being Chauvin. He was being a police officer. He was doing a job, which is to contain whoever, whomever the law deems must be contained. And he was using the techniques he learned or techniques, strategies he developed over time to do that. So I guess my argument is that George Floyd would not have died the way he died if we did not have the police. Okay? Suggesting that 
Chauvin is the problem. It's, it's, it's mistaken. Because whatever Chauvin did could be done by somebody else and have been done, will continue to be done by other people within the profession of police. Because the description of the job itself requires that, that level of aggressivity, that level of inhumanity. Okay? Now that we have to understand right off the bat. But to take this understanding a little further, we have to understand what makes it possible for Chauvin, their Chauvin in this case, to do what he did. Why is it all of a sudden racism is a subject of interest? Why are we hearing all these feel-good slogans like anti-racism? Why, why? What's going on? You see, we're going right back to the areas of America enacting feel-good policies which would last for a few years, perhaps, which few would benefit, which would have little to no consequence or effects on society as a whole. Okay, that's where we are. That, that is where we are. Now, some might say it is good because there's so much injustice going on that we need to start somewhere. I agree. But that is not the point here. At least that is not my point. You see, what's happening in America today is what we could call a trend. You see, there's a trend against the police. A trend against inequality, racism. Because all of a sudden, it is politically correct to be against those things. Okay? All of a sudden, it is politically, it is socially adequate to sort of criticize those institutions and even those institutions themselves or looking at themselves in the mirror and try to at least give the impression that they are against themselves. Police officers are coming out and saying, we need justice. You know, we need to protect. We need to do this, this and that. When in fact, they know this is impossible. Because the idea of having a police in a society is ingrained in the notion that the entity called a person must be controlled, must be refrained must be restricted, must be restrained. And to do that, there's only one way. It's violence. You cannot have peace without violence. At least you cannot have anything resembling peace and order without violence. On the part of the entity that is supposed to guarantee or on the part of the entity that is supposed to maintain that peace. So the violence itself is necessary for peace. And the entity that is there to guarantee that peace is usually the police. Therefore, the police itself must be violent, must use violence. But that violence is justified to the extent that the people that are supposed to be put under that violence agreed via or through a social contract to be victimized by that violence. At least that's the circular argument that you always hear, that like, you agree to be uh, subjected to the violence of the state. Therefore, you have consented to that violence and you sort of, it's part of your reality. Okay? So the police itself are there to make that violence in a tangible way so that the person who's subjected to that violence knows that the police's job is to do violence, to, to instill order, to guarantee peace. So therefore, the police in and of itself is an instrument of violence. See, when you hear folks talking about the idea, no justice, no peace, and you hear the same folks saying, well, we need to protest peacefully. Well, it's a fallacy. 
where they're telling you nonsense, step back and understand what they're saying. At least try to understand word by word the meaning of those words and the effects of those words, then you're going to be lost in the debate. You have to step back and make sense of what they're saying because those words contradict themselves. In this podcast, I could not talk about racism or what's happening in American society uh, in detail for the simple fact that um, there's no need to do that now because there's there's so many things happening in the world. There's so more, much more things that are going to happen that, you know, there's plenty of time, you know, to talk about those things. Okay. But what we need to understand right now is that there's a false debate. There's a false sense of security. There's a false sense of joy. There's a false sense of uh, retribution against those who have condoned injustice their whole life. There's a false sense of of reclaiming individual rights or collective rights, whatever you want to call it. Because the reality speaks differently to what the narrative is right now. There cannot be peace unless there is violence. There cannot be violence unless there are people who are willing to do that violence. And there cannot be people who are willing to do that violence without institutions that guarantee that these individuals or those who engage in violence will not be or this will not suffer the consequences of their actions. So that takes us 180 degrees to the notion of racism, the servant protect and all that, all that nonsense about you know police brutality. See? It's it's sort of like it's a, it's it's a nonsensical idea to suggest that the police are not supposed to be brutal. The police are supposed to be brutal. That's the whole concept of the, the police. It it needs to be brutal. Otherwise it's not the police. It's the Boy Scout. Why do you think they give the police officer guns? To play basketball hoops with the the neighborhood? Why do you think they give them batons? Hmm? Just to play around with you? Why do you think they have radio for backups? Why do you think they have all those gears? Because it is part of the job description. Therefore, the police are an element, the symbol of violence. And it is the violence of the state. The police symbolizes the state and its sheer root capacity to incur, to impose, to interject, to insert violence into the people that the state is supposed to control within a particular boundary, which could be a society, a community, uh, a town, a city, and whatnot. Okay? So that right there we have to understand. Okay? So if you don't understand that, then the rest of the conversation is not for you. If you cannot understand that the police are not supposed to be a peaceful entity, then there's no need for you to continue listening to what I'm about to say. Okay? The police are there to instill violence. The police are not there to fraternize with you. The police are not there to be your friends. The police are not there to sort of show you how life is great, life is good. Therefore, the idea that the police are supposed to be good entities within the context of being a good guy, it's a nonsensical idea because right off the bat, the definition of the police implies the the understanding that the police are there to counter anyone who is against the rule of the day or the rule du jour or du jour, okay? Therefore, the police itself is not there to be your friend. The police is supposed or are, the police are supposed to be brutal. The police are supposed to be tough. I was a police officer. I was trained to do violence. Everything I was taught in the academy. I was taught here in Missouri, in Fort Leonard Wood. Everything I was told in the academy was for me to be violent. You see, I remember in the academy, I was trained to control, to subdue somebody, or in this case, the citizenry. I was trained to use a baton. At the time, they call it a club. I was trained to restrain, to to detain, to handcuff individuals. 
I was trained to do hand-to-hand combat with individuals. I was trained to shoot. Although, I must admit that the doctrine of shoot to kill within the police these days uh, was different back then. Back in the 1990s, when I was trained as a police officer, shoot to kill was not necessarily the main objective. Nowadays, the police are trained to kill. The design, the whole function, the whole foundation of the profession is to inflict pain, harm, damage unto the citizenry. How how does that conflict with the notion of serving the citizenry? Now, when I joined the police, I was under the impression that the job would be to act a certain way against those who act a certain way, like the bad guys, this idea. Well, into the profession itself, I realized that the police had nothing to do with protecting the good guys. There were no good guys. In fact, for the most part, we were the bad guys. Because I remember. I remember. So that's what, that is why when I came to America, I knew what American police was about because I was trained by Americans. They had told me what the police was about. They had told me what policing was about. So I knew who they were. So the idea that police officers are supposed to be good and the other is not good, is a bad guy, that's a nonsensical idea. I remember one officer, one instructor in particular told me, told the class that you have to have a fake weapon or a fake knife, a fake gun all the time in your possession, in your squad car or whatnot. That is, when you shoot somebody, make sure you put that or you lay this weapon next to him and say that the guy, the person drew a weapon on you. I remember listening to that instructor saying that. I was like, flabbergast. I'm like, really? Is that what we're supposed to do? What's the, what, what about our conscience? Are we have, don't we have to deal with this? With the mistake we just made? And the instructor was now. You got to protect yourself. And you have to protect your fellow police officer. You have to protect your partner. That is how I was trained. So when I came to America, I knew who the police are. I know how they do it. And I've seen it. I've watched them do it. It confirmed to me what I learned from them. So that is why when I talk about the police, it doesn't come from a place of hate. I was one of them. Proud to say that I once was. But I know what they do. I know how they do what they do. So this idea that the police are supposed to be this nice, you know, fun, you know, fun guy, you know. No, that, that, that is not the job of a police officer. A police officer is supposed to be tough. He is suppo- he or she is supposed to be tough. And that is why anytime you question the authority of a police officer, the result of that questioning is likely, likely going to be damaging for you. You are likely going to be arrested. You are likely going to be thrown in jail and you are likely going to be beaten. How dare you question the authority of a police officer? I wrote that in several of my books. I have talked about that. So you have to understand who the police are and why they are brutal. Their job requires that brutality. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with racism right off the bat. Nothing to do with it. It's the job description. The police officer could be as brutal to a black person as he could be to a white person or to a Latino. The problem, as I try to explain here, is when society itself, the state itself, the government itself allows the officer to mistreat certain people with absolutely no no repercussions. A police officer couldn't dare beat a white person in certain neighborhoods. He couldn't dare beat a, a white person or question a white person driving a certain car. Why can he do it for a black person? Why can he get away with it when he does it to a Latino? Why? And that is essentially the question we have to ask ourselves as a society. If we want to fix policing in America, if we want to fix the, 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 the injustice that, that characterizes the police, we have to not allow officers to get away when they behave that way towards a certain group of people. Although it is part of the job description. Every aspect of the job requires violence. You cannot be a police officer if you are not willing to do violence. Okay? So right there, the idea that some police officers are good, 
is just a bunch of few bad apples, as they say. It's a nonsensical idea. The idea that the police are there to serve and protect, it's also a nonsensical idea. The police are there to guarantee the status quo, okay? The police could not serve and protect. They're not there to serve and protect those who might be a threat to the status quo. And it's usually everyone except for those who run the status quo, or in many cases, the police themselves. The police are there to guarantee the status quo, whatever that status quo might be. Whatever it might be, that's the police job. Though implicitly stated, but every police officer knows that his job is not to serve and protect, his job is to preserve the status quo. If preserving the status quo means that I am going to protect that individual or that entity or that group that are good, that are there to maintain the status quo, so will it be. There, there is a reason why President Trump automatically evoke, you know, the National Guard or the military to come to the streets of America. There's a reason for that. Because for a brief period, there was a sense that the status quo was going to be overthrown. There, there was a real threat to the status quo for a brief moment, albeit for a few days. And at that point, Trump understood that the police could no longer do their job. The violence that is required to quell that threat, the police couldn't go, couldn't do that. That was the purpose of the military, okay? Now, of course, in other countries, like third world countries or autocratic countries, authoritarian countries, they don't have to sort of tell you what they're going to do. The police, the military sort of, it's the same, right? You're in the streets doing things that threat, threaten the status quo, then automatically you're going to meet with the sheer brute force of the state. And the state is there to quell whatever you're doing. Okay? It's quelled. Stop it. So the state will not do that. And gentlemen, a military is not there to talk to you. A military is not there to sort of explain to you why he is kicking your behind or why he's lodging this bullet into your body. That's not his job. His job is to do what he's told. So that's the reason. Sort of when Trump said that, it, was, it became clear to me that the state was in a state of panic. The American state was in a state of panic. For a brief moment, there was a loss of control there. Because the rage was so great. The rage, the anger was enormous on the streets of, of America. But the idea that there are good police officers and there are bad police officers is a nonsensical idea. Now, of course, some police officers are more prone to that violence than others are. And those who are more prone to that violence are likely to do it without any restraint, any self-restraint. And that is why the system always comes in to protect these officers because they are paid to do violence. They were hired to do violence. And when they do violence, they cannot suffer those consequences because the whole concept of the police requires that violence. Okay? Now, there's a line between racism and policing. Because, you see, this conversation is sort of, sort of lost in the debate. Because a lot of people who are talking, especially on Twitter, I've, I've been watching a lot of people on Twitter talking, putting out tweets. See, they're mixing those two things together. See, when they're talking about violence, when they're talking about policing, when they're talking about racism, it is as if they're talking about the same thing, right? And when I hear folks talking about this institution of racism in America, and when they talk about that institution, they talk about the effects of the institution, but not the institution itself, right? Because to me, these are not the same things. See, the institution is something else. 
the person who comes into that institution is also something else. What the person does as an element of that institution is also something else. What society says in response or how society responds to what the person did as a member of the institution is also something else. We cannot mix them all together. If we do that, then whatever we're saying is nonsensical right off the bat. And that's going to make people laugh. Because you see, if you're going to say to me that a police officer, or in this case, Derek Chauvin, did what he did because he happens to be racist, and therefore we need to address police brutality, we need to address people like Derek Chauvin, then we are missing the point. You think Derek Chauvin goes home and starts beating his wife? You think Derek Chauvin goes home and beats his neighbors? You know, you think that's who he is? I don't think so. There are people who have a different idea of who Derek Chauvin is. But when Derek Chauvin is wearing that uniform, whatever monster that's underneath him, that's inside of him, that monster is going to come out. Then we have to ask ourselves this question. Wait a minute. Is Derek Chauvin the bad guy? Or is it the fact that he's a police officer that makes him a bad guy? Or is it the fact that the police entity, the police department, makes it possible for him to behave the way he behaves as a police officer? Does that make him a bad guy? Or is it because America is a society that allows those brutality to happen because that's what keeps America what it is as a country? Those questions are separate questions we have to ask ourselves as we try to understand who Derek Chauvin is and how many Derek Chauvins are there. If we don't look at the issue from this angle, then we are prone to, to, to at least go with this idea that, okay, we're going to do this, that's going to solve the problem, and, think, and 20 years later, we're going to come back to the same place because we don't understand, at least we didn't address the human nature, the societal nature of the conduct itself. What made Chauvin do what he did? Or why he did what he did? Why on earth did the police department try to cover it up initially? What's in it for them? Why is the President of the United States calling people who are protesting this injustice thugs and whatnot? What, what's going on here? You have to look, look at the larger societal picture. Also look at the larger human picture. Like I said, I'm not going to delve into this, into this debate, you know, the crux of this debate. But, but, but I will echo a previous sentiment as I wind down this podcast today. And that is, the police are supposed to have a certain amount of power to exert or to do their jobs. And that power is the power to do violence unto whoever, whoever the state deems in, in contrast to what is peace, according to the state's definition of peace. Anyone or anybody, any entity who is against the state's definition of, of what order is that is why the police have guns. That is why the police have tasers. That is why the police have batons. That is why the police have pepper spray, uh, all kinds of gears or instrumentations to instrumentalize that violence. That is their job. The police are supposed to be brutal. I know it's a brutal understanding. It's a brutal reality, but that is the reality. If you are a police officer, you don't understand your job is to do violence, then you don't understand your job. If you look at the police officer thinks that the police officer also is supposed to be nice to you, then you don't understand what the job of a police officer is. Now, of course, people are going to tell you something different. They're going to try to make you believe that the police are there to fraternize with you. The police are there to sort of uh, do community service, to protect, to serve and protect. That's nonsense. That is nonsense. That is nonsense. The police are not there to serve and protect. At least not you. The, po the police are not there to serve and protect you. The police are there to serve, perhaps, the society as a whole, and they are there to protect the status quo as a whole. Not the individual that makes up that society. Not the individual that makes up that so social environment. The police are not there for that. They're not there to protect that entity. And if that entity happens to be black, which the society itself does not value as a member, as an equal member of the society, then 
then the police are going to do violence against that entity, that individual, without any repercussion. And that is why racism comes into play. And usually the police are in the forefront of that racism because the racism is a state racism. It's, it's, a, it's a racism advanced by the, by the state itself, by the, by, the, by, the, by the society itself. So when you see race, a racist police officer, it is not necessarily because the individual himself is racist. Rather, it is because the entity that he or she represents is racist. And the, to the extent that it is racist, it is exclusionary. That is, it is an entity that, takes, that does not value a certain group of people because of their skin color, their country of origin. The fact that they're male or female or either or or transgender or gay or lesbian. But the police in and of itself, the police individual in and of himself or herself is not acting on his own. He or she is acting on behalf of the state. So the racism must be understood from that perspective, from this lens or from this prism. In this case, Chauvin if he were to be racist or if we were to consider him racist that would be something separate from what he did okay chauvin's racism has nothing to do with the action that he posed on mr floyd the state is to blame this is one of the reasons the state tried to cover it up the state tried to protect chauvin or the other officers that is the reason because the state knew Chauvin was acting on its behalf. So we have to understand that. And that is why when you hear folks talking about anti-racism, you can tell they don't know what they're talking about. Because they sort of assume that racism is an individual problem. No, racism is a systemic problem because it is part of a system. Racism is a, is a collective problem because it is part of society as a whole. We as a society allow it. And so long as we allow it, Individual actions are sort of irrelevant to the larger social societal problem, which is racism itself. So I'm sure, I am sure Chauvin is a good, is a good father. He's a good husband. He's a good neighbor, perhaps. Chauvin is not racist 24-7 of his life. Nobody is racist 24-7 of his life. The idea that John is racist because he's always racist, it's a nonsensical idea. The idea that Jonas is not racist because he's always not racist is just a nonsensical idea. There are circumstances where we act as racist and there are circumstances where we don't, depending on where we are, who we're dealing with, and under what circumstances we're dealing with that individual. But when the state itself makes it possible, when the state itself makes it possible, then it becomes a reality that certain people experience. And the police, as the forefront of the system itself, becomes the vanguard of that racism. They become the face of that racism, but they're not the racism itself. They are that, the face of the racism that is stale in nature. That is, it is from the state itself. And we have to understand racism from that angle before we can talk about anti-racism or before we can talk about police brutality. Shut off that. Everything we're saying is nonsense right off the bat.